Hi there, everyone, and welcome again to Painless Universal Conversation with myself, Anne Welsh. Are you an athlete? Are you someone who's worked so hard to achieve your dream and all of a sudden you what you've you know you've qualified and you're going through the practice to train yourself and all of a sudden you get an injury? How do you deal with the mindset? How do you deal with recovery? My guest had to go through all that pain. And she'll be telling us about her own journey, how she overcome the mental pain, the emotional pain, and the physical pain to get herself back up and ready, preparing for 2024 Olympic. Janelle Shepherd is the second athlete from St. Lucia to qualify for the high job finals in the World Championship in, in Atlantics. She was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and moved to St. Lucia with her family at the age of two while representing the University of South Carolina to become the 2015 NCAA champion before graduating. She competed for St. Lucia at the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio. She placed 26th in qualifier and did not advance into the final. But she was the flag bearer for St. Lucia during the closing ceremony. Her personal best in the high jumps are 1.6 meters at top. We'll be talking about how she's preparing herself to get ready for the 2024 Olympics in Paris and the challenges of being an athlete and how she overcomes this to find her joy. Meet my most amazing guest, who I can't wait to talk to, Janelle, as she shares her story. Well, hello everyone, and welcome again to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Marsh. As I said in my introduction, today is overcoming pain and finding your joy. Being preparing yourself, preparing your mental strengths. To becoming the best. Have you ever thought about what these athletes actually go through to become the best and actually going on to compete in the Olympics? My guest Janelle will be sharing her story. How are you Janelle? I'm good, I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Thanks for asking. I'm really honored to have you here today. I mean your story is, I, when I, whenever I interview an athlete, I am so excited because I think you guys are special, extremely special, because it takes a lot to actually motivate yourself, to find that discipline, to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going mm-hmm. to be consistent with my effort. You are an elite athlete. You've complete, complete, uh, com- uh, competed in the Olympics and you have done the World Atlantic, uh, Atlantic um, Championship. You've done so much and... I always wonder how, before we get started, can you tell me, who is Janelle? Who are you? (laughs) Well, I think uh, one thing you said about the motivation aspect of it, I think for everyone, there's something that really like, this might be cliche, but things that you're super passionate about that when you do them, they don't feel like work. And I think for athletes, that's just one commonality across all of us that the sport that we do, it's, it feels like fun. And that's the best part of it. And I think that's one huge aspect of motivation. And then to your question, who am I? That's such a big question. Um, where do I even start? I grew up in the Caribbean. I was born in Jamaica, but I grew up in St. Lucia, which is a really tiny island, a little bit south of uh, uh, Jamaica, basically. Um, Yeah, we moved around a lot when I was a child. I lived in Grenada, Barbados, St. Lucia, Jamaica, um, because of my dad's job. So I I had friends everywhere, which was the way that I looked at it. Fortunately, you know, I wasn't like sad that we had to move all the time. I was just excited to have a new best friend in a new country. (laughs) Um, And I was involved in sports from a really young age. Um, I think my parents were trying to... uh, make sure that there was something I was good at. So they put me basically in every single sport. I tried everything and I was not good at a lot of them, (laughs) but I did tennis, ballet, modern dance, swimming, um, table tennis, ooh, I was terrible at. A little, like a little stint with martial arts, also terrible at. Um, And then finally found my way to athletics. And yeah, I was a little bit taller than the rest of my cohort. So they suggested I try high jump. And that was kind of my first introduction to it. And it's, yeah, once you start, if you are meant to get into high jump, once you do it the first time, it's kind of like no turning back. The feeling of flying, uh, it's incredible. So I've been kind of hooked on it ever since. 
and you, um, you just said something that really re resonates with me is about that passion you just said once you love doing what you do it doesn't feel like oh my goodness I have to motivate myself to get up because I think about my son he loves ice hockey to bits and mm -hmm. I always wonder how did you wake up at five in the morning to go for your training how what what gives you that drive even if he goes to bed you know sometimes these teenagers they go to bed whenever they feel like it even in, no matter what you could try to convince him and he still has the energy to get up at five in the morning I'm like what yeah. are you doing so when you think about that resilience when you first tried that high jump the flyover like you call it what was it in you that gave you that sense that this is something I truly love and it's something I think I want to go ahead and keep doing. Yeah, well, I think, to be honest, initially, it wasn't so much this feeling of flying. I think that developed over time, you know, as I got better as an athlete, because then you really learn how to get the technique properly. And then you, you actually have like the real experience of a high jump. But when I first started, and I wasn't very good in the beginning, um, what really enticed me was the idea of traveling and representing my country, because I knew that you could make national teams and then go on to like, for example, the Carifta Games, which is a regional competition held between various Caribbean islands. And I had friends who were competing in that in swimming, for example, and I just thought, oh my goodness, this is like the coolest thing ever, because I loved traveling and yeah, the idea of representing your country in something just seemed like something I needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and on top of that, I found out that you could even get scholarships to get a free education through athletics. So at that by that time, I was basically sold. I was like, cool, this is what I'm going to do. I seem to be pretty good at it. And then the more I did it, the more this love of the sport developed. So I think that was crucial. It was crucial for me to like uh, take something I already loved, this traveling, exploring, representing my country, and tying it to the sport, which really like pulled me in. And then I could start to experience it and understand that, yeah, I really love this. In your childhood, you said your parents were very supportive. I mean, they put you in different sports. And this is something I think many parents that uh, will be listening to this will want to understand. How was it growing up as a child? Was it difficult moving between um, one sport to the other? And how, how you know, what was your what was your household like growing up as a child? Uh, yeah, sports was al always very encouraged in my household. Although my mom was never really a sporty person, although she's definitely into fitness, um, she somehow still always encouraged me and my brother to participate in sports, and my dad equally so. So I remember you were asking, how did I move between sports? And this is like a very visceral example. Like every Saturday when I lived in Grenada, I would go to three sports practices in a row. We would, me and my best friend, we would first go to, I think in the morning it was swimming. And then we would get in the car, change, go to tennis, get in the car, change and go to ballet every Saturday. And either her mother or my mother would be doing the driving around. So yeah, my parents were extremely supportive. I don't think I ever thought about that as a barrier, like what will my mom think or what will my dad think or will they allow me to do X, Y, Z? That was never really, never really an issue. And I think in retrospect, that's huge because it allowed me the freedom to just like explore. Also, because if there was a sport that like, another memory that's funny is that uh, when I really started to get into tennis, I told my mom, you know, like, oh, I need some gear, I need a new racket, like, can you get me some tennis skirts, you know, and we live in the Caribbean and they don't sell these things normally, so you have to order it online, it needs to be shipped in, and it's, it's quite expensive, and, you know, she got me all of this stuff, and I think like a month later is when I first tried high jump, and <laughs> then that whole, you know, so I, I totally went straight into athletics and basically, basically gave up the tennis. And I mean, she wasn't too tore up about it. She was still supportive of me. So that also, I think, made a huge difference. <laughs> That's so nice, though. It's really nice to share that part of it, because it's true. Sometimes with kids, they, they don't really know what is it that they will actually fit fall into. Is it this? Is it high job? Is it this? 
but and parents have to also have to bear in mind there's lots of going to be lots of sacrifice that will be made along the way and it's something that if you truly want to support your kids you just have to endure yeah. that part of things um you spent your college year at the university of south carolina how did the environment mm -hmm. shape your competitiveness? Because there's one thing actually doing it, and there's another thing actually now becoming the bringing out the competitive side of your sport. How did that environment shape that for you? That's a really good question because um, athletics in the states or sports in the states in general is completely different, I think, in the collegiate environment than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So you can go to uh, a school in the States and they will give you a full scholarship to compete basically to represent them. And within that system, there are basically like endless resources to help you succeed. So at the University of South Carolina, for example, which is a division one institution, which is like not to go into detail, but it's like the top level of schools for sports you can go to. Wow. Um, they have a lot of money, a lot of finances to be able to support athletes because they have lots of donors who contribute towards this pool of funding to provide scholarships. So we had student mentors, tutors for uh, our academics. We had a uh, top of the line coaching staff with endless accolades to support us 20, so 24 seven, basically. We had top of the line facilities. So we had multiple um, gyms we had access to. Uh, our track, of course, which was also like the, some of the best facilities you could use and um, the equipment that we got. So the shoes and the clothing and stuff, we got so much equipment. You could not be asking for anything because we had so much. And coming from like St. Lucia, we we're like, I didn't even have a pair of track spikes. <laughs> so arriving there to this amount of support, I was overwhelmed. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like, we had all of our meals provided for us. You didn't have to think about anything. It was all catered. So it allowed you the freedom to like really explore your potential because you don't have to question like the, the small details of like, oh, what am I going to cook or how am I going to get food? How do I make money? All of these things are taken care of. All you need to do is like focus on achieving your highest potential. That's really phenomenal. I mean, that is the, that is something very rare, not anywhere. I don't think there are very few countries in the world that are like that because, you know, I see some other countries and it's so difficult for athletes because they have to sponsor everything, you know, everything. And that takes time away from you. As an athlete, I think your mind needs to be 100% focused on what do you want you love and doing it well. Because with this help, you were able to compete in the 2016 Olympics in uh, Rio, you know, when you got this opportunity to compete, how did this shape your whole um, commitment to the sports you are in? And tell me a little bit about this sport you are in, in case anyone doesn't know about it. Um, yeah, so I would say my mindset and everything already changed within the setting of university at the University of South Carolina, because another aspect of what made that whole situation special is that um, the level of competition within collegiate athletics in the States is as high as it is on a world stage. So the people you'll be competing with there, guaranteed you're going to see them at the world championships, at the Olympic Games, etc. Because, of course, the system is so efficient, it does what it does so well, it produces the best athletes in the world, basically. Um, so I was really prepared for the world stage, having competed in that environment. You know, my coach, she had been to various uh, junior world competitions as a coach. So she, she had plenty of experience to be able to lead me in that direction as well. And yeah, in my junior year, when I qualified for the Olympic Games, I, ha I had gone undefeated that whole season in uh, the athletic circuit within collegiate athletics. And I had the world lead jump for some time and yeah, in retrospect, it's interesting. I, I didn't think of the Olympic Games as that big of a, a jump from <laughs> the level of competition I had there, but it's just because it's so high. Mm -hmm. It's so incredibly competitive. So what, what are your emotions when you represent your country at these prestigious events? How, how do you feel? What, you know, because the youth looking up to you right now is thinking, wow, she's done all this. What were your emotions? What feeling during those times? 
Yeah. Oh man, competing on a world stage, there's nothing really to compare to it, I think, to be honest. It's such a special experience. Um, one of the things that first come to mind is that uh, athlete, athletics is a pretty small sport. So the people you compete against, you see them often. So throughout the year, when you're going to competitions, you're going to see the same people over and over. And then you get to something like the world championships or Olympic games and you're seeing the same people. So you're having this like experience together and you make so many friends. So I, I had a, have a lot of friends within this high jump network and we would go to these like life chain, you know, like huge events together and have all of these experiences. And I think it makes such a huge difference to do that with people who like you care about. So you're not alone, even though it's, it is an individual sport. So that's one aspect that really makes a huge difference to me. And, um, what can I say about the feelings? Uh, at the Olympic Games, I was super starstruck. You know, I was really young. Uh, this was the biggest event I had ever gone to in my life. I was representing my, my, my nation, a lot of people supporting me. Um, and I was definitely starstruck. Uh, I came into the Olympic Games with a bit of an ankle injury. So I didn't compete to the best of my ability, but I don't think that really took away from the experience because you know, the Olympics is not just about competing. We like to talk about that aspect the most, but there's also the Olympic village and the people you meet and, you know, training in the, that environment with the best athletes in the world. You're there, I was there for a month, surrounded by people who are like at the very margin of like the human capability in a sport. So that was just an incredible experience. And yeah, you said something very phenomenal because it's true. When we talk about sports, we only talk about the competing side. We don't talk about the other aspect of sports that that the joy brings to one. It's not the joy is not just to compete and win. That's not only the end goal. The own end goal could or the goal could also mean your mental and uh, your mental stable stability, your your diet, your learning to network as well, meeting a whole bunch of people that you never have thought in your life to meet. Can you just tell me a little bit about that mental framework and the diet, the preparation that goes behind the scene, that which that bit which is omitted whenever anyone talks about sports, they leave, leave out that mental bit, the diet, the, the networking. What do you gain from all these opportunities? Yeah, I think so. When you talk about the mental aspect or like nutrition, for example, it just if you think if you're a professional athlete, you know it's your job. So there's in a in a nine to five, you're going to have various things that you're responsible for that um, you, you need to answer to your manager for, et cetera. But as a professional athlete, you're the manager, you are the employee, you are the business. So you're responsible for all of those uh, different aspects and something like nutrition or finance or mental health are just basically responsibilities that you need to attend to. So the way I approach it is, is just like that. I try to keep some structure around um, how I'm making sure I address all of those things so that they're not getting forgotten or neglected because inevitably when you show up on the world stage, anything that you've neglected is gonna show up in that, mo in that moment. You know, if you didn't prepare mentally, if you didn't do that kind of like self-coaching or visualization or whatever it is that works for you, in the moment when it matters the most is you know when those weaknesses are going to show up yeah. so for me personally um i listen to a lot of podcasts that's my preferred method of learning about anything scientific or nutrition or diet wise and from there i, I get a lot of uh, recommendations to other resources to read and and things like that i know a lot of other people hire nutritionists and things of that sort but nutrition is kind of my side passion so I would say that like I spend a lot of my time learning about it not just for my sport but just because it's interesting to me so I, I, I haven't I've hired someone once or twice but this is just something that I I love for myself and the mental aspect I just read a lot I read a lot there's there's a huge body of information available to athletes to do with mental performance if you're willing to look into it um, so again, it's one of the responsibilities as part of my job. So I spent a lot of time reading about mental performance. 
When you talk about nutrition, um, if someone who is really into sports, what kind of things, guidelines would you give them or key things they should be doing to their body to enhance, I know, to enhance their performance in terms of eating the right food? What kind of things and things not to really eat? Well, how, do you, how do you, what advice do you give people normally? Yeah, well, I think it depends very much what stage the person is at, what level of education they already have, because um, the level of detail you want to go into or the amount of information you want to give someone should be based on where they're starting because you don't want to overwhelm someone with like a bunch of science or uh, micronutrient details when they don't even know like I don't know the macronutrient composition of an apple or you know like the the, the simpler things so that would be the first thing that I would ask um, but there are some basic I think um, little nuggets of advice I would give, not just to athletes, but to anyone in general, uh, keep a, it, and, and it's super simple, they, they're not gonna be that interesting, you know, like keep a varied diet, include lots of vegetables and fruits, make sure your plate is very colorful, eat until you're satisfied. Um, yeah, include fun foods. I think that's one that we neglect a lot because I don't think that you should feel um, that you're, missing out so much that you feel cravings or you feel like you're you're not like like your diet is really making you sad or like making you miss out so you should include fun foods plan for them um, everything in moderation but uh, I don't like to think about cutting things out I usually like to think about adding things in so like what are you missing what kind of micronutrients might you be able to include by adding in some more cruciferous vegetables or something like this that's really good. That's a really helpful tip because it's true. Sometimes we think we should totally cut everything out and, you know, it doesn't really work out because then the food is bland and then you think, is this something I have to live with for the rest of my life? This is no way of living. And you feel like, you're in a, you know, you've punished yourself. You're in a death sentence already before the um, planning begins. In yeah. May 2021, while attending a training camp in preparation for the Olympics, you suffered a severe injury. And that must have cost you enormous pain because it's something you were preparing to go to the Olympics and all of a sudden this pain injury happened. What were your thoughts at the time and how did you recover from this injury? Yeah, that's been really tough for me because this is my first major injury. I know a lot of people uh, in athletics most people have had injuries. We deal with little niggles here and there. Basically something is kind of always hurting and you're just maintaining because again, you're working at the margin of your capabilities. So you're, you're trying to like balance, like squeezing out as much as you can without breaking things. <laughs> um, and this was the first time I had like a major injury and it was so ill-timed because after the 2016 Olympics, I was going into a new Olympic cycle and moved to a new country, started training with a, a different coach, very different style. So when you do things like that, it takes some time for you to basically like acclimate, get used to the different kinds of techniques, the country, the people, the foods. And right around that point, I think I was finally, you know, like getting very comfortable in all of those things, getting used to this new type of training, this new coach. Yeah. Um, and also kind of improving on the old things that I would, I, I, I knew or I wasn't so good at in the past. So like confidence was a big thing for me, being confident as a jumper, that was something that was finally coming. And yeah, we were in Turkey, I was at a training camp and it was so strange how it happened. It was a normal jumping session and I just heard a pop in my knee when I was taking off, it didn't even hurt. <laughs> so I didn't think anything was wrong, but that was basically the beginning of a really long, journey to come back to just being able to walk far less run or jump so yeah what what kind of um recovery process what kind of um uh, infrastructure did you get for the recovery process and were you still able to compete in the olympics or did you have to fulfill or not do it anymore yeah, so I subsequently had an MRI after the initial injury and um, the doctor basically told me that my meniscus was completely ruptured and that's not something that can be, um, 
you, you can't like continue to train on that because then you risk damaging the cartilage in your knee and that's like that's like long term really bad like maybe a knee replacement in the near future type of thing so uh surgery was basically the only option and this particular surgery where they need to sew your meniscus back together you need to have your knee then immobilized for the next six weeks um, and immobilizing anything means atrophy muscle will disappear uh, so yeah we already knew from that point of view that the olympics was a foregone conclusion this was in may the olympics would be uh, at the end of july and i yeah it would it would just not be possible time-wise uh, lucky for me, though, my coach is also a physiotherapist, so she was extremely supportive. She would come to my home during the six week, week period where all I could do is lay in bed, you know, couldn't put any pressure on, on that leg, just to mobilize the joint and make sure the incisions were fine, um, discuss next steps. It was great for me physically, but also mentally, because she kept like my expectations in check. She would discuss with me always like, um, what we've done, the stage that we're at, we, what we've achieved, how far we've come, and then like what we're going to do in the next session. So though I was laying in bed every week, you know, I had like little milestones to look forward to, little exercises to try to uh, achieve additional like range of motion. Um, and then another layer of support I had was that because I was living in the Netherlands, the healthcare system there is is really good. And I had health insurance. So everything was taken care of, you know, the surgery, my doctors, uh, I saw doctors that work with the Dutch national athletics team. Um, so they were all extremely qualified. And yeah, great, great support team. One question I have to ask is that, you know, when you have your mindset onto doing into doing something, you really you know, this was not something you prepared for you wanted to do the Olympics in 2021. When this happened, how did you change your mind to understand that this is no longer big being possible, that all our hard work, it's almost like going for a deal and you put all this effort into it and again, they say that you lost out. How did you train your mindset knowing that you were not going to go be able to compete anymore in that 2021 Olympics? Yeah, oh man, it was such an interesting process. I think when I first had the injury and I knew when I was going to have the surgery, my immediate thought was, okay, well, the next Olympic Games will only be three years away because, you know, this was 2021 because they had to push the Olympics one year. So I'm already calculating, you know, like when's the next thing, uh, you know, I didn't consider in that moment the reality of how difficult the process would be. So I think that set me up for some real lows during my my uh, recovery, but it was necessary because it gave me like the opportunity to reflect on my career and to also think about what kind of athlete I want to be going forward because I had this like this pause where I couldn't be like training, 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 looking forward to the next competition, trying to be the best I can be. I had to sit and just be and just, you know, like let my knee heal. It's a lot of time to think. So I think in that sense, I gained a lot, but it was very up and down. It wasn't like, okay, my, my mindset is that everything's going to be great and I feel great every day and it's positive. It was much more uh, valleys and then uplift from my friends, my family, my coach, and then I could journal about it and, and kind of get past things and move on to the next hurdle. And, and that's, that's kind of been the path to where I am now which yeah it's been interesting well that's really interesting because um, I, I've seen it uh, and I've seen a lot of it happen and even myself with a chronic illness I've had plans and I'm really excited about those plans and uh, looking forward to go do these things all of a sudden then my illness comes on then yeah. I, I can't go ahead it's done it's done doctor say you're not going out you can't even leave the hospital you you and then you, you think to yourself, what is this whole life all about? Uh, why do you work so hard? And all of a sudden something knocks you back there. And you can honestly imagine how you must have felt, especially because of someone who's worked, you've worked so hard to get yourself to this point. And all of a sudden, bam. but in all of this, you have your eyes set on the Paris 2024 Olympics. How are you preparing for recovery and striving towards your goals? 
yeah, just, I'm just trying to stay very practical, just trying to commit to being consistent um, because I think that's one thing that you can lose with an injury because it's very monotonous and it's, it can be really boring at times because I'm not, I'm not doing running workouts. I'm not doing any high jump, which is like the most fun of training. I'm doing much more basic and uh, foundation work things, which can get boring. Um, so maybe that makes you not want to train one day and then you don't train for a week and then maybe you, you get in your feelings and you're down. So the key to this period for me is just staying consistent. I have my schedule. I want to stick to it as best as I can, not beat myself up too much when I uh, uh, have a bad day or my knee swells or I, I just feel kind of unmotivated. Just consistency. That's, that's basically my mantra until I can get back to like uh, completely being healthy, then I can change the goal, you know, then maybe it's not so much about consistency anymore, then it's about like rebuilding and making these big goals again and getting excited about high jump. But for now, it's just be consistent. That's a big enough goal for right now. <laughs> and now before I let you go, I have to ask you this question. For all of us, you've never experienced this personal dedication in sports. I mean, you know, I've never had to work this hard and I've seen it. I've seen the true results you come up with. Where do you find the right balance between your commitment to your um, athletes and your personal life? How do you balance it or both? Mm, that's a good question. Oh, so many things I could say on that. Well, say, we'd we'll love to hear. Go on. I think one of, one of the most important aspects is to kind of review who you surround yourself with mm -hmm. because there are people in my life who are related to sports. So I have friends who are also athletes and I have friends who aren't athletes. Um, but even my friends who aren't athletes, they respect that this is my job and they're not going to try to pull me in directions that don't support like the lifestyle that I need to live in order to be a good athlete. And I don't think that you can neglect how important that is because it just eliminates one layer of um, like self-control, I guess, because as, as an athlete, again, because it's your job, there are some things that you're just not gonna be doing. Like you're not gonna be drinking on the weekends and Maybe you need to take a little bit of extra care with your diet. And I have friends and family members who respect and support that. So they're making it easier for me to stay on that path. So I would say that that's definitely one really big factor that helps me to balance my personal life. And then also something I've learned from the injury is just like sometimes when I'm anxious or stressed about how I'm going to get a workout in because I committed to going for lunch with so-and-so or my boyfriend wants to go on a trip, but this is going to interfere with my training schedule. I just need to kind of like bring it back to reality and realize like in the scale of my entire life, missing one workout is not going to destroy my career. You know, like just <laughs> because as athletes, you can get really like a type personality about I got to get it done. I can't miss a day, but in reality, that's not how it works. And you need to have a little bit of compassion for yourself to keep like mentally healthy as well. It's not just about like, you got the workout in, it's about like, how do you feel? <laughs> are you are you making sure that you're like, you have a community and you're spending time with them and you're, you're pouring back into your cup with those things as well as your workouts? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say those two are kind of my top two most important things that's to really that is truly really, you know honestly i love what you just said because it's so true we forget yeah. ourselves we forget the bigger picture of the world we just look at just now why we also have to think of longevity of our health our body this body needs to be looked after it needs to be pampered it needs to be taken care of and you know it, whatever it takes looking after the body is not just playing sports. There are ways to look after your body as well. So I think that's also a grooming process that people who play athletes also need to manage that. That's 
because we have to also look at the longevity of our body. It's not just the top 10 to play and win these various medals, but what happens after it. So I, I love that you said that. And, my, uh, and before I let you go, I have to ask, because young girls and young boys out there are looking to you and thinking, oh my goodness, I want to really do this. What would be your advice to young boys and young girls out there looking up to you? Um, I would say, don't be afraid to pursue your passions. Don't be afraid to try new things mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to fail. If something doesn't go well, it doesn't mean that it's not for you. Failure is uh, one of the best teachers. You can gain a lot and grow a lot from that. And as soon as you can learn that lesson, then I mean, you've learned a lesson that a lot of adults find hard to accept. So I would just focus on that. Pursue the things you love, pursue your passions. Don't be afraid to fail. That's wonderful. I really appreciate your time and to time with you today. We, I mean, you shined a light on something so critical, something that we all see and look at the glamorous side of it, see you guys do your work, you know, entertain us and making it uh, really enjoyable to watch. But we don't see the behind the scene that often that goes on with someone who is an athlete and the mental, the mental strength it takes to be one. I, pre I appreciate this and thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.